Hey everyone, welcome to the Stride to Freedom podcast. My name is Russell Benaroya, and I'm the co-founder of Stride Services, a virtual back office bookkeeping and accounting firm serving hundreds of clients around the United States. This podcast is designed to help small business owners focus on growth and innovation. In other words, focus on those things that inspired you to start your business in the first place. We call it your genius zone. We do our job on this podcast when business owners feel like they have the trust and confidence to build the right team of partners around them that will help them grow. Thanks for joining. Let's go. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Stride to Freedom podcast, where we help business owners get and stay in their genius zone. You know me. I'm here every week. Russell Benaroya, your host of the Stride to Freedom podcast. The Stride to Freedom podcast is sponsored by Stride Services, where we help business owners get and stay in their zone of genius through comprehensive back office, bookkeeping, accounting, and fractional CFO support. Today, I am thrilled to share that we are going to be talking about something that really piqued my interest a few weeks ago when I was speaking with Scott, who I'm going to introduce in a second, about the distinction of building a business that creates wealth versus a business that creates income. And Scott Hamlin is such a perfect guest for this because he has not only traversed the journey as an entrepreneur himself, but he is also in the business of guiding other entrepreneurs, specifically in the IT services segment, to do the same. He is today a senior coach at PAX8 uh, and joined PAX8 in a consulting capacity after C-Level, which many of you know that are in the IT services industry, is a very well-regarded operational and financial consulting firm to help guide MSPs to create equity value, not just a J-O-B. Today, Scott provides coaching in the areas of financial management, owner level coaching, operational processes, and he's been doing this work for 30 years. Scott, how are you today? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me. So great to see you. Now, for those of you that don't know, and I don't know why anybody would, but Scott and I met, gosh, Scott, back in 2005, that when, <laughs> when you were running Packet Drivers, uh, which is a really well-respected MSP at the, t- uh, at the time, but you have since sold it, obviously, and we were running a healthcare service company and really acknowledged at the time the quality and discipline with which you provided services. So the fact that we came together serendipitously a few weeks ago is really a gift. So I'm excited we reconnected. It is. It is. And I'm uh, I'm excited as well. And uh, it's fun to see uh, both of our journeys these last, uh, I guess that would make it almost 18 years if you go back to 2005. <laughs> when we talk at, on the podcast about helping business owners get and stay in their genius zone, that thing that people do where they lose track of time, where if they could get and stay in that flow a larger percentage of the time, their their quality of output would be higher, their life satisfaction would be greater. What's your, what do you think's your genius zone? Uh, well, my, I guess a couple of things. My biggest passions are about uh, coaching and growing people, right? That's what my business was about. It's what are the, you, you know, I, there's a lot of things I didn't do well in my business, like all of us. One of the things I did really well was find good people, particularly inexperienced ones, and grow them. So I have this passion around that. But I also have a really big passion around, um, uh, I sometimes call it, you know, acting like an adult when we run a business or acting like an adult when we think about our home finances and, and you know, we're talking about income versus wealth, mm-hmm. things like that. So my passion, you know, around the idea that let's act like an adult, let's act like a mature person and 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 manage to our responsibilities in our business when it comes to finances so those two things kind of come together uh when i get to do this work <laughs> what uh, oh i i i would love to dive into what does it look like to not act like a mature adult in your business what what do you see what are those attributes or characteristics so some of us can self-identify our our own um, our own behaviors <laughs> 
Yeah, well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll stick to the finance side. I mean, we obviously sure. can, we can see that across uh, all sorts of things. Right? If you think about the e-myth, right? You know, a lot yeah. of, particularly in our space, MSP space, you've got a lot of people. I often say you own a hobby, a job, a business, or an asset, right? And so a lot of people started the journey almost as a hobby, maybe as a job, right? And so, you know, when people aren't acting like an adult, it's about not taking that responsibility that this is a business, right? You have a mm. responsibility to your family, right? If you have one, right? Your, mm -hmm. your, your, your spouse and your children, you have a responsibility to your employees. And so from the financial side, it's about, uh, you know, taking the time and the effort to really focus on financials and understand what you're doing with your business. So you're starting to reduce risk, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I mm -hmm. think that's, you, you know, we see people behave in a way that they just ignore it and, and kind of put their, their head in the sand. I have calls like that where, you know, I had one this week. We're looking at expenses. You need to reduce them because we're not doing the things we're, we need to do to have a healthy balance sheet, healthy income statement, et cetera. Mm. Why do you think many business owners uh, do put their head in the sand? Is it fear? Is it lack of knowledge? What is it? Well, I think that um, it's a, a lack of interest oftentimes. I mean, mm. I hear that a lot from business owners. They just don't, I don't understand the financials. I don't want to understand that. And, you know, there are things in our business that we do that, that maybe we outsource almost all of it but you can't yeah. outsource your responsibility for understanding at a certain level, the financials of your business. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's just lack of interest is number one. And then number two, I, I just think it's that, it, it's not a full understanding of, of, of what, I often talk about money, right? Money is not about getting a Porsche. Maybe you can get a Porsche, right? Mm -hmm. Money is about security, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's in choices in our future. And so it starts there. And, um, I, you know, I, I don't actually know that I understand why there are as many business owners that there are that don't look at their business that way and think to themselves, I've got to build security and, and reduce risk and build for a future, right? So, mm. And is that is that the distinction to be, to be made between building wealth and building income? Maybe talk about that. I want to, I really want to headline that concept because I think it dramatically changes the profile of the value that is ultimately getting created. Yeah, well, and I think it, I start with, right, income and wealth really just at a, at a personal level, right? Huh. I, you know, we see lots of people that are driving around in really nice cars and, and, and you know, maybe a nice house, which quite frankly, a house appreciates a car depreciates, right? So if it's a lot of cars, you're definitely not building wealth. But what we see that and, and, and what we see is, okay, you might have a lot of income, but did you build any actual wealth around that, right? Mm. When we translate that to the business, um, it's, it's um, you know, wealth and income, right? Wealth is something that can sustain itself, right? Um, uh, it can generate its own, right? It's its own new capital. Um, having a business that generates enough income that you can live on as a business owner. And there's still a lot of businesses in that space and that size. I, I thought when I sold my business in 2016, we're going to see this big consolidation and, and we still, although there's been a lot of it, there's still just, you know, thousands of these smaller MSPs. And so wealth is about building an asset in your business and or taking right equity out of that business and 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 building an asset around that um so that that uh it has value that sustains beyond just that just that income mm -hmm. and that translates into it you know it's funny you asked asked about this concept and i was talking about it and i, I thought about it more on a personal level but when we think about uh building uh, wealth in a business, right? So we, if I have a $20 million business. Well, let's be honest. It's worth something regardless of what I have personally, or even, you know, regardless of how much is in the bank for the business. When I'm running a $3 million business, $4 million business, that might not be the case, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it may not have enough uh, uh, value around that. So within a business, when we're talking about building wealth, um, it's the same. I was talking about choices. It's the same thing in the business. When you have cash, right? You build up you know, the equivalent, let's say, just within the business, I have choices. Um, yeah. You know, I was talking to a, a client the other day, you know, and, 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 and take this a little bit of a grain of salt. I said, yeah, you need to hire a salesperson, hire two. You've got a million dollars of cash on this, you know, let's invest it, right? So it's mm -hmm. that wealth, right? This person has built wealth 
in the business and, and separately, not just income. And now he has choices. Person that uh, lost two clients, doesn't have that cash in the business, lost their choices, right? They don't have mm. that same, they're, they're forced to make some, some different decisions. What are maybe three to five pieces of advice where you would guide owners on how to think about wealth creation that they could say, take back to their business today and take a critical eye to, to their decisions, their investments, their outlook? Yeah. So uh, the first thing I would say around, uh, you know, business and particularly, you, you know, in that three to, you know, six million dollar range um, is when, when you're thinking about wealth, build that right this is your business right your family's business maybe you have partners uh whatever it is start to think about pulling some of that out and building wealth outside the business i, I mm. often so so the number one advice i give to people uh in the, in that size range is uh plan your future and your retirement uh for not selling the business because that's that's you're asking about common mistakes one of them is oh yeah i'm just gonna sell my business that's my retirement Totally. Yeah. Right. And it's not worth anything. Right. Yeah. So, so build that, so take that wealth outside of, right. Outside of the, uh, of the business. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, inside the business, uh, I also talk often about if you have a cash, if you're an MSP standard MSP business and you have a cash flow problem, you have a profit and loss problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, mm -hmm. you, you know, we shouldn't, uh, you know, maybe if we're selling a bunch of hardware or something, but even then we should be able to handle it. Uh, so uh, manage that, right? So important part of this is manage that P&L to generate a profit, right? Mm -hmm. That's why we're in business. Why are we mm -hmm. taking risk and doing all these things if we're not generating profit? That profit builds into wealth in the business, allows us to make choices, grow the business more, and pull that wealth outside, right? Um, and I think the other, you know, a, another part of that uh, is when you're asking about why, um, why we see these challenges is that, you know, oftentimes I think it's uh, lack of interest, uh, but commit to understanding financials and managing mm -hmm. your business to the financials. Mm -hmm. right? I, 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 if you're not doing that monthly review, if you're not using something like service leadership or whatever it might be, right? A service leadership is just a tool to uh, categorize, we often refer to it as different buckets of gross income, right? It's just, yeah. okay, you know, if I'm in managed services, I ought to be making 52%, you know, gross margin. If I'm selling a laptop, I ought to make 20% gross margin. And if I intertwine those two things, I don't understand my business. So understand how that works and then manage to it, uh, not just on a, uh, a yearly basis or a quarterly basis, but a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you understand that, it allows you to make those, uh, those decisions. Um, and so cash is king, right? I mean, it's an old concept, but the, the, the more you build income, the more you build cash, the more uh, uh, flexibility you have around building that wealth. What I've experienced is that uh, building wealth is a is a step function method of of investment, and what I mean by that is to build a business to go from one million to three million, three million to ten million is not just about doing more of the same. It is about investing in systems, people, and process at another level, and oftentimes. The, well, not oftentimes, 100% of the time, the investment required precedes the growing into that size of business. And so what I've seen many times is that the, you are the least profitable when you are in that kind of three to $5 million range because you're in that, that ambiguous middle zone. And I'm wondering how, how you guide owners to take that leap because it is a it's a leap it's a profile change in the business yeah i you know i, I think first of all on that concept right um when i sold my business the 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 owner of that business I, I, there's a lot of things i respected about uh patrick but one of them he said we're gonna make a profit right and mm -hmm. and we're gonna run this business that way mm -hmm. but if we decide to go from 20 percent down to 10 percent, you know ebitda as long as I understand my numbers and I can understand that, I can think of it as investment as long as I manage to it. Now, a lot of times we have a three to $5 million business and they're just 
right? They just kind of make yeah. a leap, right? So, you know, the advice around that is, you know, um, make, you know, financials are about making an intentional decisions around what you're doing. And, and certainly, you know, we talk about these different barriers, right? There, and, and you run into them all along, I guess, right? I mean, I have not managed a $100 million business, but I suspect, right, they run into walls too, you know, like everybody else. And so, you, you know, when we get to the size that you mentioned, those processes, uh, those financial statements, uh, all the things around your business become so much more important and, and, and they can get off the rails quickly. I was just talking to somebody about, um, you know, I often talk about revenue and if we're going to grow revenue, it's not about growing revenue. It's about growing good revenue, right? Mm -hmm. Good gross profit revenue. You can destroy your business very quickly at three to five million if you, you know, start taking on three, you know, uh, clients outside of your uh, target client profile. So, um, you know, get those processes in place, understand your numbers and make intentional decisions around, you know, breaking through that next, uh, that, that next level for sure. I imagine when Scott Hamlin descends on a client with a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience that a, a client, while very uh, motivated and energized, could also potentially feel overwhelmed. Like, hey, where do I begin? So how do you navigate through the, the journey, like grab their hand, the Obi-Wan Kenobi, grab, grab their hand and sort of point down the river and do it in a way that maintains their energy without having them feeling like, oh my gosh, I am swimming. Yeah. Well, I, I will say this, I'm pretty fortunate that I don't write most of the people that I work with, uh, th th something's brought them there, uh -huh. right? So, w w w you know, I talked about uh, maybe a lack of interest in financials, but, uh, you know, it's I'm, I'm not, you know, running down the street, grabbing some MSP owner and saying, come in here. And they say, I don't, I'm not interested, right? They, they've hit a point for whatever they reason. They knocked on your door, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, you know, we're, we don't have any problem around energy and getting going. Certainly, uh, there can be some frustration in that journey in terms of, of, of getting there. But it is amazing. Um, you know, I was on a, I've already been on two calls this morning, and I, I was talking to somebody. It's a, it was a relatively small business, and, and uh, she, she does the books, partner in the business. And, you know, she was... Uh, you know, talking about gross margins. She said, well, you know, I was just on, I, I won't say who the, the, you know, the other group was, but it was sure. this, this other kind of peer group, so to speak. And she's, you know, said that you needed us to get the numbers and ours was 42%. She said, but I don't believe it. And I was like, okay, this is, I, mean, I love talking. Great. I'm glad you don't, because she would, you know, wants to understand what that is. So I'm fortunate that I'm getting people like that. They're, they're at that point. Um, I can't, you know, you have to find it within yourself as a business owner to 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 realize that that that, that matters. And once you do that, um, you, you're going to have enough passion. And then once you start to see the numbers and what really generates profit, right? Um, you know, we're going to go through another transition in the next five to ten years about the way we sell MSP services. You know, is it going to get integrated, or is it going to be one package that includes all of your Azure and you know it, it, everything? And so. We have to understand how do we, you know, how do we model it and price it and all those things. And so, um, you know, I, I think the light goes off when people understand how they're really making money versus just I go out and sell it and, you know, I get this much revenue and this much cost and, yeah. you know, I don't understand it. it if I were to, if I were a, a MSP owner and I was trying to self-assess whether or not now is the right time to say call on somebody like like you because i'm i'm ready how would i know like what would i be feeling thinking seeing that would lead me to yep ah, it's about time yeah well certainly the obvious right is when we have financial trouble right uh and we don't understand why we have financial trouble uh, now that said that's a, a relatively small percentage of the, the the people i work with i would say most people right when they realize that they want some help is when they look at the financials they see the results now this doesn't always mean bad right it might be good i, I work with partners that um you know might have 22 percent ebitda which is a you know a very good performance in this space um okay. and they have no idea why right mm. so 
it's, it's when you realize that um, you want to do something with your business and you don't understand uh, what's really going on from a financial perspective in the business. That's it, right? I mean, it's just that simple. And, and uh, we help uh, first align it, right? And then we help dig into why, right? I, service leadership is a great tool. I often talk about all it is is a book with numbers, right? It has nothing, it doesn't, okay, I've got uh, 20, 27% gross margin. If I can even yeah. trust that number that it was right yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Why? Why? And that's what, that's the light bulb that goes off for people is why. And then how does it scale? Um, I, I have quite a few calls where our profitability is good, but our managed services gross margin is poor. So maybe they're, maybe they added some ancillary services and they're able to, you know, market up a hundred percent, which isn't what you could really do on the open market and probably isn't the way it's going to scale you got to fix it, right? You mm -hmm. can't scale the business. So when people understand that owners, uh, operators of the business, uh, that's when the light bulb goes off. Talk a little bit about uh, intermonth versus intramonth financial management. What I, what we often see is I, as a business owner, I don't pay attention, don't pay attention, don't pay attention. And then I get my financials on the 20th of the month for the prior month. And then I, I freak out and then I get settled down and then I, you know, the yeah. journey continues versus no, I I'm able to keep a pulse intra month. Like I recognize it's hard to do real time accounting, but are there things that I can be looking at during the month to give me a pulse on how we're tracking? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm laughing at the question a little bit. You're being quite ambitious to talk about intramonth. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> I know. I know. Would be intra year or uh, yeah. intra quarter. Good point. Uh, you, you know, you know. Think about that question. I, you know, I think it kind of goes back first to right financial alignment and understanding the numbers. Right. So we have to understand. So uh, I might be a business that. Um, uh, covers all my recurring costs just through managed services, right? And yeah. it's important still to know what all those other numbers are uh, versus a business that um, cannot, not only doesn't cover it, but is counting on, I'm just going to make numbers up. It doesn't really matter, but let's say it counts on $50,000 a month in non-recurring services revenue uh, to get to, you know, 5% yeah. you know, EBITDA or something like that. So once I understand what those numbers are, now I understand what's important intra month, right? And I, you know, I have partners that I work with that are in that boat where um, they need that non-recurring revenue to get there. And so it's all about right finding the right KPIs intra month to understand. It's not just intra month, right? It's it's intra month in February about what does our project pipeline look like? How many VCIO? uh or or quarterly business review uh do we have scheduled so that i'm projecting out and can hit those numbers and then having kpis during the month around you know it might be product you know non-recurring product sales uh you know it probably shouldn't be if you're an msp but uh but certainly that that variable uh number um under but it's also under you know we're talking about accounting catching up it's also uh understanding what those cost of goods sold and expenses are and how something might be impacting this particular month. So KPIs, understand the numbers first, right? To really understand them and what what's important. And then it's KPIs to, to monitor that during the month. Can you talk a little bit about uh, reports that you guide MSP owners to be looking at now again the numbers may not be correct but what are the what are the core sources of reporting that you guide them to as the foundation for having a discussion and making observations so um, one of the things I do when I when I'm coaching with somebody let's just QuickBooks as an example, but you know, if they're using QuickBooks and yes, we've got service leadership and quarterly, you talked about intermonth, right? Mm -hmm. Service leadership or any benchmarking systems quarterly. Um, I'm setting up reports so that I can see them, you know, real time. So what's, what's important, we were talking about wealth versus income, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember going to a peer group and somebody was talking about the balance sheet. Oh, the balance sheet's the most important thing, right? And it's kind of reiterating maybe what you hear about Fortune 500 companies. Uh, and it's not, you know, the average MSP, the only thing on the balance sheet that probably ought to matter is your cash, right? And, and, and receivables, you shouldn't have debt and things like that. But cash is important. So that's the first thing is that 
flexibility and choice and, and lowering risk is, is about that. And then it's about really understanding um, our gross margins, right? Our gross profit. And so having uh, in, in your financial reporting system, having reports that are gonna show you what you're doing in, in, in gross margin. I look at a P&L, full p and I look at the bottom line, and if the bottom line says 5%, I wanna go find out why, right? And build a story. And if it's 20%, I wanna build a story. Um, and so those gross margins are that other part I talked about, even if you're doing well, is understanding why we're doing well. And maybe we're doing well the last six months because we did have a whole bunch of non-recurring product sales and I've got my head in the sand and I don't realize that uh, that was uh, because COVID came along and people were investing in remote work or whatever it might be. We, you, know, you have to understand that. So uh, building those those gross margin reports and having those accurate numbers, I think are the fundamental start of a business. Then when they don't make sense, now we're looking at something like let's say MSP CFO or whatever it might be to better understand where the root uh, problems might lie that are causing those numbers to be something other than what we want. How do you guide uh, owners on this concept of of leveling? Let me explain. Leveling in that at some level, there's bookkeeping accounting work that needs to be done. That's generally a rear view mirror looking set of activities. There's a forward looking set of activities, which we call financial planning and analysis, or at the highest level would be fractional CFO. But it's not enough to just say categorically, oh, you need better accounting and financial management and believe that that resides in a single individual or a single function, really. So how do you, how do you guide an MSP owner on that leveling structure and where to make investments and at what time? Yeah, well, I, I, I think that, um, you know, we often talk uh, about expecting what you expect, right? Yeah. So we will coach somebody, come back six months later, we're expecting, and on the financial side, in particular things get out of alignment uh, pretty, pretty quick. So when we look to the, um, you know, every business is different, right? Um, might have an owner that actually financial literate and and maybe a partner in the business that also can um you know manage a a bookkeeper even if it changes every six months and and, and they can sustain that right and 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 do their planning and and look to the future in other cases uh, maybe we don't have that and 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 we need um you know to outsource or whatever it might be um consistency you know getting the right process and numbers and then consistency um you know, is super important. And when you need a CFO, right? I, I mean, we can throw terms of controller, CFO, sure. financial sure. analysis, account. I mean, I, I, you know, I probably say 10 times a day, I'm not an accountant, right? So uh -huh. it's, it's like a disclaimer, so I don't get sued, um, right? We could use all sorts of different, different terms. Um, but as we grow, we need to, you know, under, understand um, better our inputs, right, our cogs, uh, you, you know, and, and our revenue and be able to analyze that. And the, the more you want to grow, the more important it is, right? You can't, I used to, I always tell this little joke, you know, if you cost you a dollar uh, to build a widget and you sell it for 99 cents, how many do you have to sell before you make a profit? And, <laughs> right, it, it, you know, all, all that's important and it's even more important, right? If you, if you truly want to grow your business and you're at 3 million, you say, I want to go to 6 million, uh, you got to get it right. And so that's the time when you start to, to think about, do I have the right? Maybe you do, right? You know, again, maybe you have an owner and whoever the bookkeeper, they can, you know, inspect that process and they can plan. Maybe you're not that person and you need to, to, to look to other resources uh, for that. Yeah, that's that's a really nice break point in like the I'm going from two to five, three to six, three to ten. There, there's this natural point of evaluation to say, do I have the right team around me on the finance side uh, to support me in getting there? Yeah, and you know, I run into to partners that outsource right outsource their finances, and I and I often talk about accountants, and and, and I love accountants. They they, they serve a great but they're not always about financial analysis, right? Well, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. That's to start with, right? Yeah. I'm just going to section, you know, it, like if I do Haas, 
um, I'm just going to section 179, all this stuff. And, you know, now I've got next, you know, I did all in one year. So the next year I got all revenue and no cogs and it looks like I'm making money, right? Again, you didn't understand your financials. You might think you're making a whole bunch of money until you have to replace all that equipment. Um, so, you know, it's not right. So we have accountants, but it's also understanding the industry. Right? And I think mm -hmm. that's where I, I know we've had challenges around that. We need, you know, we need to do this that's more industry specific and not just getting bookkeeping done so I can give everything to the accountant, right, to file taxes. It's, it's not what it's not what we're about. I mean, filing taxes is just a necessary evil, right? right. And hopefully you have to pay a lot of them, right? I mean, and, and I'm not advocating for high taxes, by the way. I'm just advocating for high profit, whatever yeah. it is. Ho hopefully it's 1%, you know, tax rate, but, you know, billions of dollars of uh, profit. Uh, the, the the last part of this discussion that I think is really important in the discussion of income versus wealth is the realization, the realization opportunity of that equity value you've created or the wealth that you are ready to realize from this business you've put a lot of heart and soul into building. And I'm curious if you could talk a bit about how acquirers are going to be looking at or evaluating this asset that you've built in order for you as the seller to really get the most wealth creation from that asset yeah well we you know we sometimes talk about right uh multiples of uh, of ebitda right and it's well right like to overinflate their their numbers or underinflate them if they're the buyer yeah. right and talk about the concept of the buyer's uh multiple and the seller's multiple and they're not the same thing we actually did, I did a webinar with um, with um, the company that acquired mine uh, a year or two ago. We talked about that. Um, and, and, you know, I think particularly as we get more private equity money in, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at a business and, and wanting uh, to understand what those numbers mean. So even if you're not making as much profit, right, if they can decipher, you know, when and why, they might be willing to, to, to by the way, they're not going to give you Right, that that difference in multiple, I'm not gonna give it to you as the seller, right? So if you're if you're running a poor business, right? You got, you know, too many dispatchers or project managers, they're not gonna just go, oh well, you got too many, we're gonna cut them. So we'll pay you what the you know, multiple would be if you didn't have them. Uh, they might give you a little more, but they're they're right, they're they're not gonna pay you for it. So you know, they're looking for a profitable business, and the more profitable business you have, the more they're forced to pay for that. Versus actually, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if I'm a buyer, if I can see that, if it's clear to me where you have the problem, they're going to underpay you, mm -hmm. right? So I think as a as a seller or somebody that's trying to realize uh, that wealth we talk about through the sale. And by the way, I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing my job, which is to say, you shouldn't be counting on that. If you have a three million dollar business, if that's what you're counting on, you ought to have, you know, pull money out of the business, invest in the market, right? You, you know, however you do that. Um, and, and, you know, so you have that, you can combine it, but you want, right, having those good numbers forces that buyer to pay for that gross margin ultimately, or EBITDA is the way we calculate it. But, but ultimately, a lot of it has to do with, with gross margin, right? Because sure. you know, a lot of that overhead is going to go away. Yeah, and, and increases a lot of confidence in a buyer when you can demonstrate that you have command over your numbers. It doesn't always have to be straight up and to the right, but knowing why what happened, why it happened, and giving them trust that in their due diligence, they're not going to find any surprises. It's the undermining of trust that gets people skittish about paying full multiple. Yeah, and I, you know, you were talking about, talking about understanding numbers. I, this is the story not making it up that, you know, somebody was a buyer, uh, had an acquisition target, uh, started to get, you know, had an offer, a uh, letter of intent, accepted, um, started to go through diligence and the uh, seller had to back out because they didn't understand that they had to pay back all that deferred revenue. <laughs> right. So, hmm. um, you know, you've got $150,000 of deferred revenue. That's still an obligation of the buyer, right. To do that. Go a step further there's a lot of people that don't have it as deferred revenue but if you if if the buyers do on their right due diligence and they find out that you've collected one hundred and fifty thousand dollars of revenue it's not on your it's on your books as you know past revenue but you still have a debt obligation you got to pay back the 
the buyer, right? Because they have to go service that. So, yeah. um, you know, all that, all that stuff's, you know, pretty important. And the only way you get there, if we go back, is to understand the numbers, even if you don't really enjoy it at some level, right? You don't have to be a financial expert, but you have to understand um, enough to be able to operate the business. Know the right questions to ask and equip yourself with the right people around the table, which is a good segue into my last question, which is how do people engage with you, Scott? How do they find you? How do you enter into and manage relationships? Yeah, so Pac-T, in, in, you know, true disclosure, right? I, yeah. I'm semi-retired and, and work part-time and uh, most of what I do uh at pax 8 within this you know pax 8 academy formerly yeah. c level is all around financial uh financial coaching but but as an organization um we provide uh coaching to msp businesses and it starts on the operational level right we we have content that goes all the way including through the financial part of it um and so if you don't already engage with with pax 8 uh through the services um you can certainly go to Know, the website and learn a little more about the academy there's links on the website that talk about it uh and it's all about uh empowering msps to be better uh, business owners right certainly i do it on the financial side but it's all about right process and being a good operator around that mm -hmm. and so do people to find you let's say they wanted to find you would they get to you through pax 8 or would they just reach they out go to through you PAX directly? 8. No, no, they go through pax 8 for sure okay. um okay. you know most of what i do like i said i work i work part-time and uh, yeah. but you know certainly they uh you know my my email address is uh at, at pax 8 is shamlin.c at pax 8.com but uh you, you know the um you know, we're all about getting people in the academy uh, educate them on a whole bunch of different levels. And, and then when the financial part of it comes to me, uh, but, but if there's a need, uh, definitely reach out to Cami and certainly reach out to me uh, directly around that. Um, we want to, you know, we want to empower uh, the community. That's, that's, that's what we do. Scott, what I appreciate so much about this conversation today is that you've come full circle to being in a space where you're giving back to a community that has given you so much that you've learned so much from, and you're just trying to pass on some of this learning and discipline to help other MSPs create a future of wealth, however they choose to define it. That's really admirable and appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's fun and, and, and I appreciate you uh, having me on. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great day. And we will see you on the next episode of the Stride to Freedom podcast. Bye. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you.